This week's episode of our show has been sponsored by HeroForge. HeroForge lets you design custom 3D miniatures for your tabletop role-playing games. Using their web-based character building platform, you can fully customize your character's appearance, choosing from hundreds of weapons, armor, and equipment, and then positioning them in a dramatic pose. Your original miniature is 3D printed to order and shipped to your door. The miniatures are finely detailed, durable, and an absolute joy to paint. You can even download digital STL files to use with your own 3D printer. For those of you that don't like painting miniatures, good news, you can even order the miniatures printed in full color with HeroForge's new amazing color process. And now, onto this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything Dungeons and Dragons, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today, we are talking about our top 10 invocations for Warlocks in Dungeons and Dragons 5th Edition. There are dozens of invocations to choose from, and it's hard because you only actually get to pick about eight by the time you finish up your Warlock character. So it can be really challenging to pick which ones are going to change and augment your Warlock in really impactful and meaningful ways. In fact, for most of your Warlock's career, you're only going to be able to get two or three when you first start out, and five or six around the mid-levels of play. And while many Warlock invocations have additional prerequisites, restricting you based on what level you can take them, or based on your pact or patron, it's still a really big field to look at. In, in fact, it's almost like having a, an entirely secondary set of spells to choose from. And in some cases, it can add more spells to your spell list, too. So let's take a look at the invocations that Monty and I think stand out above the rest. There's a lot to discuss today, so let's get rolling. So the first question you always must ask yourself when you are setting out to play a Warlock in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition is to blast or not to blast? And that's actually not the question, because the answer is almost always yes, unless you're going the Pact of the Blade. In other words, Warlocks are notorious for taking spells like Eldritch Blast and Hex and using that as the basis of your character build. But there's an alternative in going the Pact of the Blade, which allows you to focus on melee or possibly even ranged weapons. You don't actually have to do either of these things with your Warlock. There's lots of other great cantrips and it's possible to play a Warlock that doesn't take Eldritch Blast. But we should cover the important invocations if you do decide to do that. So if you are going with Eldritch Blast, which, let's be honest, majority of the people who play Warlocks do go with Eldritch Blast, there are some invocations to keep in mind that will greatly augment your Eldritch Blast ability. The first one being Agonizing Blast. This is really the staple of anybody who's relying on this cantrip because it allows you to add your Charisma modifier to your damage for Eldritch Blast. Yeah, and the great thing about this is that Eldritch Blast is a cantrip that scales really, really well, because instead of increasing the damage die, you fire additional beams, effectively granting you extra attacks with the Eldritch Blast. Because Eldritch Blast fires extra beams at level 5, level 11, and then again at level 17, if you have a Charisma of 20 with Agonizing Blast, you're adding that plus 5 Charisma modifier one, two, three, four times as you fire your Elder's Blast. So it can add up to a lot of extra damage. There are a lot of other great invocations that can augment it further. Once you've taken Agonizing Blast, you can take something like Repelling Blast, which is our next favorite choice. Now you're adding the plus five damage, and with Repelling Blast, you can force your targets back 10 feet. This pairs really well with some of the AoE or concentration spells that a warlock can lay on the battlefield and then blast enemies into their own spells. There is nothing more satisfying than seeing your enemies finally make their way out of the area of Hunger of Hadar, only to have your warlock blast them right back into the void. And like Agonizing Blast, Repelling Blast benefits from the multiple beams fired by Eldritch Blast. If you have several enemies that are all on the edge of your Wall of Fire or your Hunger of Hadar or your Cloud Kill, depending on whatever your Pact and Patron and all your spells are, well, you can actually fire beams at each of them, knocking them all back 10 feet and pushing them all into the area of that damaging spell, or pushing them all off a bridge, or even hitting 
the same enemy multiple times in a row to push them a very far distance. Now, we do have a couple honorable mentions that we want to bring in here. They aren't in our top 10 list, but if you are building a blaster that's focusing solely on Eldritch Blast as your bread and butter, you may want to consider things like Eldritch Spear, which grants you a 300 foot range on your Eldritch Blast. It's not really in our top 10, but it might be worth looking at. Grasp of Hadar and Lance of Lethargy are also worth considering, but wouldn't necessarily make the top 10 for Kelly and I. Now, on the flip side of the Eldritch Blast build, we have the Pact of the Blade build, which probably is going to pair with the Hexblade um, patron option. So when you're looking at this sort of option, you may not be relying on Eldritch Blast as much because you're actually going to be swinging a bunch of weapons. The first invocation that we look at for this type of build is Thirsting Blade. This invocation allows the Warlock to attack twice on their turn when they are using their packed weapon. This basically means that they now stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the other martial combatants being able to dish out multiple attacks per turn. Once you reach level 12, you can augment this further with the Life Drinker invocation. This is going to add your Charisma modifier as necrotic damage to your attacks made with your packed weapon. What's really potent about this is that if you're a Hexblade, you're basically now adding your Charisma modifier twice to your damage rolls. If you're not a Hexblade, you're adding your Charisma modifier plus your Strength or Dexterity, whatever you're using in that, in that field. This pays dividends, though, with the Hexblade's Hex Warrior feature, allowing you to use Charisma for your attack and damage rolls naturally, and then double dipping on your Charisma on your damage rolls and then that's also combined with the fact that if you are a Hexblade with the Pact of the Blade, you bypass the restriction preventing you from using two-handed weapons on your Pact weapon. So you can actually now use something like a great sword, a great axe, or a polearm and bring in all those super sweet <laughs> damage dealing feats on top of this and really, really give the other melee damage dealers a run for their money. While well, you're rubbing it in the face of all the melee combatants, you can also point specifically to the Paladin and let them know that you're about to smite better than they do. And this is where the invocation Eldritch Smite comes into play. Once per turn, when you hit a creature with your packed weapon, you can expend one Warlock spell slot to add an additional 1d8 force damage onto the attack, plus an additional 1d8 for every level of the spell. This caps out at 6d8 extra force damage, and on top of that, if the creature is huge or smaller, they get knocked prone. There's no saving throw against getting knocked prone either, so this is a great setup for a warlock to use if you've got ways to, of attacking multiple times, or especially if you've multiclassed and picked up something like action surge or have access to haste, because you can smite someone, knock them prone, and then beat them while they're on the ground with advantage on your attack rolls. These three invocations are the must-haves in our book for the Pact of the Blade, Hexblade sort of build option for the warlock, but there is one honorable mention, and that's improved Pact weapon. This makes your packed weapon always into a plus one weapon, but it also gives it the ability to take the form of a bow or a crossbow. So if you want to be a hex bow instead of a hex blade, this is your ticket. So these five invocations that we've gone over kind of encapsulate the path of the blade and the path of the blaster, but there are many other options out there in the invocation. So let's take a look at some of the cool options and see what they can do. Warlocks love blades and blasting, but they also love books too. And the Book of Ancient Secrets invocation for the Pact of the Tome might be my favorite option of all the other invocations. Because what this invocation does, you do have to have the Pact of the Tome for it, is it makes your warlock a ritual caster, but a very flexible one at that. When you select this invocation, you immediately learn two rituals, and thereafter, if you find scrolls or other ritual books or spell books, you can add the rituals in those to your Book of Shadows by spending some gold and downtime, and you're restricted to the highest level ritual you can have in there by your Warlock level, but ultimately it keeps pace with what other spellcasters who have the Ritual Caster feature would be able to get. But you're not restricted based on the class list of ritual. So you can have wizard rituals, bard rituals, druid rituals, and cleric rituals. This allows you to have rituals in your ritual book like water breathing, contact other plane, commune, but most importantly, find familiar. 
Now keep in mind that if you go Pact of the Chain, you get an upgraded and improved familiar, which can have a lot of great uses. The benefit of this invocation is that you get the standard find familiar, which is amazing unto itself, plus you get access to all other rituals. So it does kind of step on the toes of the Pact of the Chain. I still think that there are a lot of benefits to taking the Pact of the Chain, but if you're looking for more than just find familiar, this is a great invocation to consider. I think especially this is the biggest argument that if you're not going the Pact of the Blade, it makes the Pact of the Tome a really compelling choice. One of my favorite invocations is going to be Devil's Sight. And if you're unaware of how this works, this is one of the most talked about invocations in the Warlock list. It allows you to see normally in darkness or magical darkness up to 120 feet. There are very few options in the game of Dungeons and Dragons that allow you to see in magical darkness, specifically using the darkness spell. For anybody else using the darkness spell, it can actually be a little bit of a clunky spell to use. You lay down this magical darkness, and if you're inside of it, you can't see, and the people outside of it can't see in, but that means that you're both blind. It's really hard to make that work in your benefit. However, if you're a warlock with the Devil Sight Invocation, you can cast darkness on yourself, you can see everybody, and they can't see you, now granting you advantage on all of your attacks at your blinded enemies as you see normally. This invocation basically transforms the standard darkness spell into this weird hybrid of greater invisibility because now you're getting advantage on all your attack rolls against enemies who can't see you and they have disadvantage on their attacks against you even if they can see you within that blob of magical darkness. So it gives you a really fantastic combat trick, one that can also have some really cool exploration, as well as defensive perks as well. While we're playing tricks in the shadows, we might we also don't want to forget our illusions. And warlocks have some pretty cool invocations that allow them to access some illusion spells at will. But my favorite of these is Mask of Many Faces, which allows your warlock to cast Disguise Self at will. My Shadows of Drakenheim campaign, uh, Joe is playing a warlock with this invocation, and it is coming up all the time. He has the actor feat as well, so it makes it doubly potent. He's really playing on the charismatic elements of being a warlock and really using this as a tool for impersonation, trickery, and infiltration. I have been blown away by the amount of creative solutions Joe has come up with by being able to disguise himself at will, sometimes pulling tricks like walking into a hostile area disguised as one character and then changing the disguise midway through and walking out as someone else. And that is something that's pretty tricky for a lot of other classes to pull off without using their spell slots. He doesn't need to because he can cast this guy self at will. It really just turns your character into a changeling. And in my opinion, the ability to change your form, especially with a charismatic character, offers this whole smorgasbord of options for infiltration that are cooler than just trying to sneak in. You now have this really charismatic way of changing your face, walking into dangerous territories, and hoping for the best. And it's really exciting to see at the table, and it works really well. Disguise self has limitations, and it is an illusion. If someone touches you, it can spoil the whole thing. Well, Disguise Self does have a lot of issues. Creatures can touch you to determine that you're wearing a disguise of some kind. It really does invite a lot of that kind of creative thinking that we see in a lot of real-world espionage, where so often just changing your face and putting on a different set of clothing allows you to pass unnoticed by almost anyone around you. So I encourage you to explore that, take a page out of the, the handbook of spies and espionage if you take this invocation, because there's a lot of creative play behind it that helps you get around some of those limitations of disguise self. Speaking of changing your form, one of the other best invocations out there is going to be Sculptor of Flesh, which allows you to, once per day, use a Warlock spell slot to cast Polymorph. Now, Polymorph is arguably one of, if not 
the best spell in the game that both of us yeah. argue a lot. <laughs> the implications of Polymorph are outstanding, both in combat, if you have the ability to change into something like a giant ape or a T-Rex, but also with the implications outside of combat or for infiltration. You can turn into any number of creatures, and at, at higher levels you can turn into a giant eagle and help your party fly away or into situations. You can turn into a spider or a squirrel and infiltrate dangerous locations unseen and unnoticed. There are so many useful and creative ways to use polymorph. We've even had in one of our campaigns somebody polymorph into a giant spider and web uh, explosives to a bottom of the bridge so that we could blow them up later when the enemies were marching across. There were so many weight reasons that Polymorph has come up and impacted the game in such astounding ways that being able to take this as a warlock is just incredibly valuable. There are a lot of invocations that are similar to Sculptor of Flesh in that they allow your Warlock to cast a spell that isn't normally on the Warlock spell list once per day using your Warlock spell slots. A lot of those invocations are not worth it. This one is. Polymorph is that good of a spell that it is absolutely spending one of your invocation slots to be able to pick it up for almost any Warlock. It's difficult to make that determination for any of the other ones. The ones that give you ones like Confusion and Compulsion, not in a million years would I ever take those ones. But this one, 100%. So the last one that makes our top 10 is Relentless Hex. And while this one is really, really good for a Hexblade in particular, I kind of love it because I love the idea of being able to teleport this much. The way Relentless Hex works is that when you have a target that is under the effect of your Hex spell or one of your other curses, like Hexblade's Curse or the Sign of Ill Omen, you can spend a bonus action to magically teleport 30 feet to a space adjacent to that target. It's really good for Hexblades because now you can just bamp right up to somebody and start beating them up. But I like to look at abilities like this with scrutiny because even when I'm playing a blaster, this kind of on-demand teleportation can always have bizarre and interesting uses. So while I do think it's harder to use this with a blaster warlock and the the offensive use of it might not be as obvious, I do think that it's really worth considering and I love just the nightcrawler bamf 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 around. Even though it isn't, isn't quite that because you have to move your hex to somebody, there's just weird kind of orthogonal ways of thinking that this opens up because it lets you teleport in that way. Not to mention, even if you're not the Hexblade, there are times in a D&D campaign where there is an enemy that is hard to get to and you are struggling to combat it. And being able to Hex them and then bamf over to them might be the ticket you need to help out in that combat encounter. Again, I think that this does lean more towards if you are a Hexblade Warlock, then this goes much higher on our top 10 list, but it is worth considering either way. Yeah, the, the counterpoint to this one is Maddening Hex, which allows you to spend a bonus action to deal extra psychic damage to the, whoever you've hexed, and that would be the clear winner for the blaster side of the equation. Um, both of these invocations are really good, I think, and really, really strong contenders for taking. Yeah. So that's our top 10 list for our favorite invocations, but keep in mind that there are over 40 invocations to choose from, and a lot of them are really, really good. These are the ones that we think stand up above the rest, but depending on the character you're playing, the type of environments that you're going to be going into in your game, there are other options that might stand up really, really well and be game-defining for you. An invocation like Gift of the Depths, which gives your character the ability to breathe underwater and swim, might not seem very useful, but... In our nautical adventure recently in our Shadows of Drakenheim campaign, Joe took this invocation and it was incredibly valuable in the aquatic environments that we were playing in and was solid gold. Would it be worth it in a different adventure or a different campaign? Absolutely not. But there are invocations that have these weird, very, very specific uses that you should keep your eye out for when the adventure creates that opportunity. 
And just to make sure that we highlight some of our other favorites that might be worth your consideration depending on your campaign, up on the screen right now you'll see a list of our honorable mentions. These are some of the invocations that we think have really interesting implications and can actually change the game in really meaningful ways for your Warlock. Chances are that you're not going to pick all of the options that we put in our top 10. You might pick one or two or three depending on your build. If that's the case, some of these might be the standout option to complete the package for your Warlock. I think that the new invocations that we have seen added to the game through Xanathar's Guide to Everything and Tatch's Cauldron of Everything have really made the Warlock a compelling class. It's not always just fodder for multi-classing now. It is a really, really awesome class and one that I think is totally worth playing even up into higher levels of play. So this has been a look at our top invocations for Warlocks in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Tell us about your favorite invocations and some of the different combinations you've made with invocations in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. A big thank you from both Kelly and I to everyone that has been, joined our community over the years. You make what we do possible. If you enjoy the work that we do here on YouTube, please consider joining our Patreon communities and getting access to our patron-only Discord channel. You can find out how to do that by following the links in the description below. Also, Dungeons of Drakenheim, our live play campaign, is coming to Kickstarter. We've partnered with Ghostfire Games to bring this campaign to life as a 5th edition module. You can join the mailing list using the links below to be up to date on all the information regarding this Kickstarter. And make sure to check out our live play in the Worlds of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6pm Eastern on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes of that right up over here. And we have plenty more character guides and other videos right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.